Let's start. Welcome to the course of Nanomaterials Chemistry and Laboratory. Uh, let me briefly introduce myself. I'm Elisa Moretti. I teach and develop my research at the Department of Molecular Sciences and Nanosystems of Kafuskar University of Venice. Uh, my research activity is focused on uh, the development, so the synthesis, the design, synthesis, and characterization of inorganic nanomaterials with controlled size, porosity, morphology, and crystalline phases for uh, uh, environmental and energy-related applications. Um, now, let's move to an overview on uh, materials at the nanoscale. It's a small word, after all. This is an introductory lesson to nanomaterials. So in uh, this first lesson, there's uh, very few chemistry, unfortunately. Um, I know you, you have already attended a couple of um, courses uh, on uh, nanotechnology, uh, nanomaterials, um, even though I'd like to start with some basic uh, concepts on nanomaterials. And I'd like to start with an emblematic sentence by Leonardo da Vinci. Uh, Italian guys uh, for sure know who Leonardo da Vinci is, uh, but maybe also you, you, you know who Leonardo is. He's a very famous and talented scientist, inventor, artist, lived in the 16th century. And maybe you have heard about him uh, since he painted the super famous Mona Lisa portrait uh, housed uh, uh, in the Louvre Museum uh, in Paris. But I have to say that uh, Leonardo is much more than uh, this very beautiful painting. Anyway, uh, he says, and in effect, the man proves to be a divine thing because where nature stops to produce its species, here the man starts from natural things and with the help of nature to create new countless species. This sentence embodies the concept of materials chemistry, uh, that is the controlled manipulation of nature to obtain, he says, to create endless new species in the sense of compounds, uh, materials, and of course, uh, nanomaterials. One of the greatest uh, challenges for scientists is to mimic the wonders of nanoscience already present in nature. Uh, in fact, in its uh, uh, four billion years of existence, nature has found surprising solutions to its problems, designing and creating systems capable of self-organizing up to the atomic level. And uh, surprisingly, most of what nature does takes place at the nanoscale. Controlling matter at atomic and molecular levels means uh, tailoring the fundamental properties belonging to the phenomena. And of course, this is uh, the, the, the the final challenge of scientists. So to be able to mimic nature, developing the ability to combine atom with atom, one atom at a time, molecule to molecule, moving from, from small to larger scale, uh, and imitating natural processes and creating new matter. So why uh, nanotechnology is so interesting, so important, and so special. Uh, nanomaterials are the starting point of the promised nanotechnology revolution. Uh, the word nanotechnology sometimes seems to suggest something uh, that belongs far in the future, but nanoparticles that are the building blocks of nanotechnology are all around us right now and have been all around us throughout human history. Uh, they were with us when uh, human beings began making their first tools, and they are present in products that uh, uh, we buy in the grocery store every day. Uh, 
right now. So nanotech, nanotechnology involves the ability to see and control individual atoms and molecules, realizing high-tech systems. I'd like to underline that nanotechnology is not simply, simply, chemistry is not so simply. Anyway, uh, because, uh, uh, so the, it's not simply chemistry in the sense that, uh, synth to synthesize new molecules, uh, something that chemists and uh, alchemists before uh, have done very well since very long time, since centuries, okay? It's something very different. It can be seen as the boundary between atoms, molecules, and the macro world, where the properties are dictated by the fundamental behavior of atoms. And uh, uh, that, that is uh, uh, why engineered nanoparticles now can be um, specifically designed and uh, deliberately synthesized by scientists. Uh, they can display controlled and tunable size, shape, composition. Here, just a few uh, examples. Mm, the most commonly studied are based on uh, gold, uh, silver, so precious metals, but also on metal oxides, silica, titania, and many other uh, uh, elements, of course. Uh, about the, the, the morphology, you can see here nanospheres, nanocubes, nanotriangles, nanoctahedra, nanostars, nanorotes. Uh, again, the nanoparticles may contain layers with different chemical compositions. So for example, a core shell system like this one, where the core can be, for example, of gold and the shell made up of uh, silica, silicon dioxide, and coated with uh, specifically chosen anti antibodies. For example, we are going to prepare in the lab a core shell system, in our case, made up of a core of silica and a shell of gold nanoparticles. Uh, so uh, shapes can be very different, even though we usually think about uh, nanoparticles as nanospheres, okay, with a spherical shape. And uh, uh, although engineered nanoparticles get more sophisticated with each passing year, uh, simple engineered nanoparticles can be created, you'll see in the lab, by relatively simple chemical reactions uh, that have been uh, within the scope of chemists and before alchemists for many centuries. And in fact, long before people could actually see a nanoparticle through a suitable uh, equipment, uh, electron microscope, uh, human beings uh, were both uh, deliberately and accidentally generating a wide variety of nanomaterials. Uh, for example, uh, uh, by the Bronze Age, incidental copper nanoparticles would have been prevalent in human civilization. Uh, it's hard to say when human beings started making incidental nanoparticles, of course, but probably as soon as people started taming fire, uh, you can find small uh, nanoscale particles of soot in, uh, in the smoke, in the embers, okay? And for sure, in the Bronze Age, uh, copper nanoparticles were present, but the earliest engineered nanoparticles are often attributed to the ancient Romans, Egyptians, and Chinese. Uh, despite not uh, having uh, any idea about the scientific implications of what they were making, uh, they were successfully able to prepare uh, nanoparticle colloidal solutions, uh, mainly of gold, and other precious metals with uh, uh, a precise control over the size and the composition and, and also the shape we are going to see in detail. 
Of course, the most representative example is the Lycurgus cup. Maybe you have heard about it. Of course, uh, uh, it is preserved at the British Museum. Uh, the cup was uh, perhaps made in Rome or Alexandria, three, four centuries before Christ. And the most remarkable aspect of the cup is, of course, its color. Uh, illuminated from outside, uh, the cup exhibits a green jade color due to the diffusion of light, of light. but a ruby red color, um, it displays a ruby red color when illuminated from inside, in this case due to the transmission of light. And this effect is caused by the presence of gold and silver nanoparticles. Uh, since it is impossible that uh, uh, Roman artisans managed to add uh, this incredibly low amount of uh, silver and gold nanoparticles to the volume of the class used uh, to make the cup, the levels were probably added um, at a higher uh, levels to a larger volume of uh, melted glass and uh, then diluted by adding more glass. Gold and silver nanoparticles, we are going to see in detail uh, in, uh, in one of the next lessons, uh, were about uh, 50, 70 nanometer size. Uh, so they cannot be seen by an optical microscope, of course. They can be seen by a transmission electron microscope. Uh, and uh, uh, at this size, they approach the size of the wavelength of visible light. Uh, giving rise uh, to the so-called surface plasma resonance phenomenon. Uh, we will see in detail uh, when we'll, uh, we talk about uh, gold nanoparticles, and you see in the lab, because we are going to synthesize gold nanoparticles uh, uh, much smaller than this, about uh, 5, 10 nanometers. Of course, this cap uh, has been described as the most spectacular glass of the period, fittingly decorated, which we know to, fa to have existed. And it's very, very beautiful. But again, another example of nanoparticles, uh, gold and silver nanoparticles created spectacular colors in the stained glass windows of medieval churches hundreds of years ago. The artists, first of all, Romans, uh, just didn't know what uh, that the, the process they used to create these beautiful works of art actually led to the formation of uh, nanoparticles because, of course, they couldn't see uh, these uh, small structures. And I reported here um, the roses Nord stained glass in the cathedral Notre Dame de Chartres in France. You can see uh, different colors that depend on the size and shape of gold and silver nanoparticles. So, please notice here, we have five different colors and two different precious metals, silver and gold. So, for example, red, light blue and blue depends on the presence of silver, but red has uh, uh, nanoparticles with a triangle shape light blue spheres and blue spheres. But um, if, uh, if we compare light blue and blue, the, the color are due to the presence in both cases by silver nanoparticles. In both cases, nanospheres, what changes is the size. 90 nanometers, light blue. 40 nanometers, blue. And the same for gold nanoparticles. Yellow and green are due to the presence of gold nanospheres. In one case, the size is 100 nanometer. For green, 50 nanometers, okay? And of course, uh, this uh, color change is due to, the, to a peculiar op optical effect that is uh, the localized surface plasma resonance. And is typical of gold and silver nanoparticles. And here again, you can see uh, the presence of gold and silver nanoparticles with different size and shape. Okay, triangles, spheres. Uh, here we have uh, something like 
octahedra and different colors. Uh, one scientist had the right tools, uh, the age of nanotechnology was born. And in recent decades, uh, the development of microscopes capable of displaying particles as small as atoms has allowed scientists to see what they, they are working with. Uh, so you can see that, for example, SEM and TEM, scanning electron microscope and transmission electron microscope, are very, very recent. They were developed less than one century ago. And uh, STM and AFM, so uh, scanning, tunneling, microscopy and uh, uh, atomic force microscopy are very, very recent, uh, developed in uh, 1981, 1982. And nowadays, of course, scientists are finding a wide variety of uh, ways to design and synthesize materials at the nanoscale of course, taking advantage of uh, their uh, uh, different and enhanced properties in comparison with uh, the, their uh, bulk, massive counterparts. Again, uh, back to nature and how scientists attempt to mimic the nanostructure systems already present in nature, uh, you, can, you can see here hierarchical structures present in many plants. For example, uh, this is uh, um, an optical appearance of plant uh, surfaces and their corresponding microstructure. For example, here we have uh, the Magnolia grandifolora leaves, and that uh, the leaves appear very uh, glossy because of this uh, flat surface at the micro nanostructure. Uh, the dahlia flower leaves appear velvety because of this peculiar uh, microstructure. The same for the white appearance of, uh, of this flower. Uh, it is caused by a dense array of uh, hairs. And uh, here in detail, talking about that, uh, it's talking about uh, what most, that most of what nature does takes place at the nanoscale. Here you can find four types of superior properties that can be found in hierarchical natural surfaces. So in this case, self-cleaning properties, enhanced self-cleaning properties that are typical of the lotus leaf, but also uh, in present in duck feather and mosquito eye. Here we have uh, um, peculiar mechanical pro and adhesive properties. Uh, we are going to see, for example, in jack of feet, uh, octopus suckers, and so on and so forth. Uh, here, we have uh, uh, examples of uh, uh, structural coloration. So when color is not due to the presence of a pigment, it's due to the peculiar structure, typical of uh, uh, butterfly wings, uh, peacock feathers, and then optical properties uh, that are uh, present in the cicada wings, uh, and spawn spur and so on. And you can see here just the picture, but here the micro nanostructure. So for example, about the gecko. Uh, so let's try to see some examples of how nature has developed uh, nanostructure systems. Uh, we can start with the gecko and its extraordinary ability to, um, to climb and to run across any surface, smooth, rough, uh, clean, dirty, vertical. Uh, geckos achieve such a remarkable climbing because of their sticky feet. Uh, 
uh, that can grip uh, any surface. But this ability, this peculiar ability, has been attributed to the unique structure of the jack of foot made up of, uh, you can see here, made up of the so-called sete that branch into nanoscale spatulae. And please notice the size. Nanoscale spatulae are 10 nanometers thick, 200 nanometers wide, and 300 nanometers long. So they are in the range of nanoscale. Uh, each spatula produces a very, very tiny force uh, due to uh, Van der Waals uh, weak interactions. But millions of hairs uh, acting together create a formidable adhesion, enough to, to keep geckos firmly on their feet, uh, even when upside down on a, on a glass ceiling, so overcoming the gravity force. And obviously, emulating this natural design is the challenge for many scientists. Artificial spatulae can be actually fabricated, showing similar effects. And uh, it is very tempting to create a new type of adhesive uh, by mimicking the gecko mechanism. Um, and uh, because the, this uh, uh, application offers uh, very high potential in different fields. So um, many different systems, uh, ad adhesion systems, has been obtained. For example, grippers integrated with bio-inspired adhesives uh, used for the precise, controlled, and safe transportation of uh, thin and fragile wafers. Again, uh, bio-inspired adhesive-based mobile robots uh, that can climb vertical walls, uh, hang from the ceiling, or clean the underwater surfaces. Again, the microstructures enable wearable sensors that strongly adhere to skin, uh, where continuous deformation and, and sweat may, may occur. And uh, uh, finally, uh, these peculiar adhesive systems could be used, could be employed to work in extreme environments or areas affected by environmental disasters. So there are many, many applications, starting from uh, the technology gecko inspired. And how can we obtain this? Um, with the microfab microfabrication of a, a dense array of flexible, of course, plastic, in this case, pillars, usually made up uh, of polyamide. Uh, the, ge the geometry of which is optimized to ensure they, their collective adhesion as uh, the, the spatulae of the gecko feet. These are two uh, scanning electron micrographs, and uh, uh, you can see uh, how a closer resemblance to the spatulae of uh, a gecko. Okay, another famous example of how scientists attempt to mimic nature is that related to the lotus effect. Uh, it refers to self-cleaning properties that are the result of ultra-hydrophobicity uh, as uh, that exhibited by the leaves of this uh, flower. How does it work? Okay. Uh, dirt particles are usually picked up by water droplets, consider the case A, this one, uh, due to the uh, micro-nanoscopic architecture. So the, there's a very high contact angle that washes out contamination particles from the surface. So when a water droplet falls, out, falls on the surface of a lotus leaf, it forms a, a spherical bead and can be easily shaken away from the surface while simultaneously 
uh, removing dust and contaminants that are accumulated on the surface of on the leaf. Uh, in case B, uh, it's uh, a, a traditional surface, so not uh, with uh, ultra hydrophobicity. Uh, you can see that the the drop has a very low contact angle, so it cannot clean the surface, the surface, and it is uh, not uh, um, shaken away. And this is why, due to this peculiar self-cleaning property, that uh, uh, the lotus flower is the symbol of purity in the Buddhist religion, for example. Here you can see just uh, a micrograph that simulates the presence of uh, water droplets, perfectly spherical on the surface of the leaf. And you can notice here the presence of uh, um, a sort of uh, wax nanocrystals, since the surface of the leaf uh, is not smooth. It is rather covered by these wax nanocrystals that provide a water repellent layer. <clears throat> Enhanced by the roughness of the surface, thereby making the lotus leaf super hydrophobic. And you can see here a mercury drop on lotus leaf, so uh, perfectly spherical with uh, um, dust and contaminants on its surface. We can mimic um, the lotus effect uh, by prepare treatments, coatings, paints, roof tiles, textiles that uh, replicate the self-cleaning properties of the lotus plant. So here you can see that uh, um, this is, of course, a synthetic approach that can be achieved by using fluorochemical silicone treatments on the surface. And uh, what kind of application? Uh, of course, uh, this self-cleaning um, mechanism can be applied to paints, glass, uh, uh, textiles and more, reducing, reducing, for example, the need for chemical detergents, reducing uh, the costly labor. Uh, you can see here, no more scrubbing of shower screens, no more Spider-Man window cleaner. And uh, uh, this is a, a nanotechnology already applied. Again, uh, we, we keep on mimicking nature with the shark skin inspired swimsuit. Um, you know that uh, many species of animals uh, have super hydrophobic properties uh, on specific parts of their bodies or uh, on the whole body, like the feathers of some species uh, of birds uh, or the wings uh, of some insects uh, or the skin of the shark. And this is uh, the micro nanostructure. Maybe you already know that uh, there's a, uh, a revolutionary swimsuit that uh, reproduces shark skin, uh, creating a dual vortex systems that can um, channel water and accelerate uh, its uh, outflow from the body. And testing by athletes resulted in an increase of their performance of 3%. 3% is really much if you consider that a gold medal uh, sometimes depends on a hundredth of a second, okay? And for example, uh, Michael Phelps, uh, the, the Baltimore Ballet, do you know Michael Phelps? Yes, <laughs> you have to know. It is the most decorated Olympian of all time. He's an American swimmer that uh, used uh, that kind of uh, swimsuit. Again, the last uh, example is butterflies. You will end up thinking of being at an ethology course. No, it's a 
chemistry course, uh, why the butterfly's wings are colored. As I told you before, color is not due to the presence of a pigment. It is a structural color. And scientists have discovered that uh, the iridescence produced by some uh, animals, butterflies, but also other birds, uh, is due to this uh, peculiar reticular structure present uh, on the surface that interacts with light, uh, reflecting certain wavelengths and absorbing others, thus assuming different shades of colors. Uh, we are going to prepare in the lab uh, direct and inverse opals that are based on this uh, phenomenon. They are synthetic, of course, but... Uh, like a Sorry? Like a Opalescence. It yeah. is like... Yes, we are going in the lab, uh, the synthesis and characterization, of course, of direct opals made up of PMMA, polymethyl metacrylate. It's a polymer, so spheres uh, with a, a controlled size and uh, uh, with the same size and shape, used as a template to prepare uh, inverse opals made up of silica and uh, we see the opalescence both on the direct and inverse opals due to this uh, peculiar phenomenon. And you can see by naked eye the opalescence, and of course we can characterize them also with the microscopy to see the micro nanostructure. And this is an, just an application, maybe the, more, the most naive application uh, a synthetic material which mimics the brightest and most vivid colors in nature and that can, changes, co can change color when twisted or uh, stretched. But these colors are due to the presence of uh, a peculiar nanostructure. It's not uh, a pigment, okay? Uh, which kind of applications, uh, for example, in security as... Um, for anti-counterfeiting purposes, but also for textile and sensing industries. Uh, this um, uh, application has been uh, developed by researchers at the University of Cambridge and the Fraunhofer uh, Institute. We can summarize uh, here with this uh, scheme. I reported here a scheme with a series of um, nature-inspired uh, products. So you can see in the green circle, functional mimetics, in the yellow one, uh, feature mimetics, and uh, the cyan represents world remarkable architecture inspired by nature. You can find here, for example, the lotus leaf we have already talked about. Uh, the, gecko, the gecko tape, the gecko fit, uh, and so on. And I've reported here the reference. So I'll upload also the, uh, the article with this uh, nice uh, scheme. Okay, all this uh, to say that uh, many peculiar properties depend on the nano size of a material. So let's start from a nano. Nano means dwarf, uh, and uh, uh, one nanometer is a billionth of a meter. So 10 to the negative nine power of a meter, uh, and this defines a length scale that is fundamental for uh, uh, a peculiar class of materials affecting their mechanical, optical, electrical, magnetic, uh, um, thermal properties. Just to have an idea, um, the size of uh, a nanometer is uh, um, comparable in size to the DNA double helix, 
you can see here, approximately two nanometers, and uh, the size is uh, over um, 100,000 times smaller than the diameter of a human hair. This is the definition you have to know. One of the definitions, uh, in my opinion, uh, um, the most correct definition. A nanomaterial must be at least in one dimension between one and 100 nanometer in size. Okay? Uh, this is not the only definition accepted and used. So you could find in other definitions that materials with at least one dimension below one micron, so in this case, 1,000 nanometers, are referred to as nanomaterials. So you, can, you could find uh, sub-micrometric materials that are defined nanomaterials. I prefer to consider this definition, okay? So a nanomaterial must be at least in one dimension between one and 100 nanometers. This is the range. And these are some examples. This is a nanoscale referred to the diameter of different forms of matter from a hydrogen atom to the planet Earth. So, uh, a hydrogen atom is one angstrom, so 0.1 nanometer. Water molecule, 0.2 nanometer, so two angstrom. Here we have uh, an example of nanomaterials, carbon nanotube, but it could be carbon or it could be gold nanoparticles, uh, um, nanostars, uh, and so on the DNA double helix, and uh, again, a red globule, dust mite, uh, uh, one euro coin, uh, uh, till uh, the, the planet Earth, uh, that is uh, in nanometer, 12.7 uh, peta nanometers, okay? <laughs> And this is uh, uh, an illustration titled The Scale of Things, uh, created by the US Department of Energy. Uh, it provides a comparison of various objects um, to help you to, to, to envision exactly how small a nanometer is. So uh, you have natural and man-made things. Uh, the chart starts with uh, objects that can be seen by an unaid uh, eye, such as an ant in this case, and uh, um, progresses to objects that, uh, that are about a nanometer or less in size, as in this case, DNA, atoms of silicon, or uh, the molecule uh, uh, ATP uh, used in uh, humans uh, to store energy from food. And the same uh, in the right side. Man-made things started from the head of a pin with uh, an area of one, two millimeters, down to carbon nanotubes, carbon buckyball, And now I'm pleased to introduce you Richard Feynman. You know who this man is, of course. Uh, okay, um, the ideas and concepts behind nanoscience and nanotechnology started with his talk. It, it is very, very famous. There's plenty of room at the bottom. Uh, this talk was given at uh, an American uh, a meeting of the American Physical Society at the Caltech, the California Institute of Technology, in 1959, so many years ago, and long before the term nanotechnology was used. In his talk, uh, Feynman, Nobel laureate after this, described a process 
uh, where scientists would be able to manipulate and control individual atoms and molecules um, through uh, the so-called um, top-down approach, so the physical approach. It would be in principle possible, I think, for a physicist to synthesize any chemical substance that the chemist writes down, give the order, and the physicist synthesizes it. How put the atoms down where the chemist says, and so you can make the substance. Easy peasy <laughs> for him. <laughs> but uh, what is important is uh, that Feynman considered the possibility of a direct manipulation of individual atoms as a more powerful form of synthetic chemistry than those used at that time. As I told you before, uh, nanotechnology is not simply to th synthesize uh, uh, new molecules or uh, compounds. It involves the ability to see and control individual atoms and molecules realizing high-tech systems. And uh, this is very nice because uh, during the meeting, Feynman concluded his talk with a challenge. Why cannot we write the entire 24 volumes of the Encyclopedia Britannica on the head of a pin? Uh, so uh, it, uh, the challenge involved the possibility of scaling down letters uh, small enough so as to be able to, um, to fit the entire 24 volumes of the Encyclopedia Britannica on the head of, of a pin. We, we've just seen that the area is about one, two millimeters, okay? By writing the information from a book page on a surface that was one twenty-five thousand smaller than in linear scale. And we have to remember that we are in 1959. In 1985, Tom Newman, a Stanford graduate student, successfully reduced the first page of Charles Dickens' A Tale of Two Cities, and he could collect the Feynman Prize. He had a problem before receiving, and, uh, receiving the prize because he couldn't find the text after he had written it using electron beam lithography. Why he couldn't uh, find the text? He on the what? He on the because? Uh, well, you have to think about that uh, even though uh, the surface of the pin is just one, two millimeters, the text inscribed over it is very, very small. So, uh, it's etched at the atom level, so the, the resonance of the atom might change. No, it's very, no, 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 it's much uh, simpler, the answer. And, and is that, sorry, that the head of the pin was a huge empty space compared with the text inscribed on it. So he couldn't find just a page, okay? There's plenty of room at the bottom. Okay, that's, uh, that's why. After that, so over a decade later uh, than um, Feynman's uh, talk, um, Professor Norio Taniguchi coined the term nanotechnology. And a uh, few years later, Drexler um, described a new approach, different from the top-down da um, top approach, so the physical approach proposed by Feynman. And this was a new approach, the bottom-up approach. The bottom-up approach involved uh, molecular manipulation uh, that is the chemical approach we are going to use in the lab. In 1986, 
Draxler published the book Engines of Creation, the, the Coming Era of Nanotechnology, which finally popularized the, the term nanotechnology. And at present, nanotechnology is uh, widely used uh, in uh, many fields, uh, medicine, nanomedicine, electronic uh, space information science engineering, uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of fields. Uh, I go very fast on this uh, slide because uh, uh, I, I guess uh, you have already seen this in detail, maybe in uh, previous courses. Just to recap that nanomaterials show uh, different and special physical, chemical, magnetic, electric, optical properties in comparison to their bulk material. Why? This is uh, the answer, essentially due to the uh, very high surface to volume ratio, okay? So, these properties are due to the small size and their huge, huge surface area compared to the bulk counterpart. And also because the electronic band structure changes upon the transition from individual atoms to bulk metal. So um, nanoparticles display uh, intermediate properties between uh, single atoms and bulk materials. And that's why sometimes they are referred to as superatoms. Okay, why nanomaterials so are so important? Essentially two reasons. The first one, the opportunity to exploit new properties due to the size effect. And the second one is uh, the need to miniaturize. Just to, um, to give you a couple of examples. Why nanomaterials are so important? Because we can exploit uh, the peculiar properties that changes with respect to the bike material. Physical properties change, for example, the melting point changes. Also chemical properties, the catalytic activity is much higher in nanomaterials and that's why, nano, mm, that's why nanomaterials are used as catalysts, photocatalysts, Electrical properties, for example, the conductivity changes. Optical properties, the luminescence changes. Again, thermal properties in, in terms of heat transfer, insulation. Mechanical properties, strength of a material change from bulk to nano. An example, the melting point, uh, uh, I reported here gold, but it would be the same for uh, uh, tin, silver, uh, lead, uh, and many other metals. Uh, metal gold has a melting point of 1064 degrees Celsius, but significant melting temperature suppression is observed. You can start from here when the particle size approaches the sub-20 nanometers range. Here we have the temperature expressed in degrees, okay? And as a function of the particle size in nanometers. And this is the profile. So when particles are larger than 20, 25 nanometers, you can see that the melting point is 1064. But for example, in this case, if I consider a nanoparticle of about five nanometer size, we are here, the melting point is about 800 degrees, 200 degrees lower than the metallic, the bulk gold. And this is simply, simply due to the fact that gold is nanostructured. Why? Because uh, 
with a great number uh, of uh, atoms exposed, heat can break down the bond between them at a lower temperature. So the smaller the particle, the lower its melting point. This is a size effect for nanomaterials. Again, for catalytic activity, we have macroscopic, microscopic, and nanometric structures. And the surface, the ratio between surface atoms with respect to total atoms. And you can see these three numbers and the order of magnitude, how it changes. So in nanometric structures, we can consider that one atom out of two is exposed on the surface. And of course, the surface atoms are more unstable and directly expo exposed, for example, to reactants, so becoming more active from a catalytic point of view. The second reason why are nanomaterials so important? Uh, the need to miniaturize. You can see here Colossus, the first computers created by Alan Turing. Okay, the first computer was about 30 tons, just to have an idea, okay? And now, of course, we have smartwatch, smartphone, uh, iPad, uh, and so on. Uh, Okay, as uh, Colossus and Alan Turing, and maybe you've watched uh, uh, a movie, The Imitation Game. Uh, it is a nice uh, movie based on the biography of uh, Alan Turing, a crypto analyst who decrypted German uh, intelligence codes, uh, the, the Enigma machine, uh, which uh, the Nazis used to send coded messages. Uh, so he worked for the British government during the Second World War, and he created the first computer. Uh, why miniaturize? Mini miniaturization means uh, lowering cost, uh, increasing reliability, increasing power, that means uh, uh, less uh, thermal dispersion, parasitic uh, loads, uh, and also reducing the response times, so less inertia, less thermal mass. The last example about miniaturization, this one, smaller devices easily fit many places. Uh, this is a video capsule uh, that contains two cameras. It is already commercialized. Uh, like a pill, it uh, runs uh, uh, through the, um, the intestinal tract, uh, starting from uh, esophagus, uh, stomach, uh, stomach, sorry, and, uh, and so it is ingested with the help of, uh, of a glass of water. And uh, uh, normally after 10 hours, that is uh, the, the, the battery lifetime, the pill has already been expelled. PCAM is uh, so a non-invasive capsule endoscopy platform for visualizing um, small bowel and colon to detect and monitor uh, lesions, tumors, uh, and assess uh, treatment efficacy, avoiding, of course, uh, uh, avoiding the patient uh, sedation and an uncomfortable uh, procedure. So why miniaturize? This can be a useful answer. And of course, uh, uh, if we talk uh, about uh, miniaturization, we have to talk about nanomedicine. Uh, I reported here just the scale. I'm not a biologist, and of course, uh, you'll, uh, you'll attend uh, uh, courses related to nanomedicine in this case, but just to understand how uh, nanomaterials uh, can interact with, uh, with biology, with uh, bacteria, cells, uh, red blood cells, uh, and so on.
So we've uh, already finished uh, just a few slides uh, about uh, the preparation of nanomaterials. Uh, as I told you before, I mentioned before, there are uh, two different approaches, uh, physical and chemical ones. Uh, of course, uh, nanomaterials can be produced uh, uh, by using very different techniques. Uh, and this means uh, different precursors, uh, purity grade uh, of reagents, uh, uh, different costs, of course, uh, different reaction times, uh, and different final product quality. We are in this range uh, according to uh, my favorite definition of nanomaterials. Uh, and the two approaches are the bottom-up and the top-down. So the bottom-up is the chemical one, the top-down is the physical one. So the top-down approach refers, uh, usually we start from a bulk material and it refers to slicing or a successive uh, cutting of a bulk material to get uh, micro nano-sized particles. So the most used uh, techniques are uh, photolithography, microfabrication etching, milling, microprinting, and so on and so forth. The bottom-up approach is the chemical one. So it refers to the ability to self-organize, self-assembly, a nanostructure material starting from uh, atomic or molecular levels. And uh, um, going to a nanoscale structure. The most used uh, um, techniques and methodologies are the spray vapor pyrolysis, precipitation co precipitation, hydro solvo thermal synthesis, sol gel approach, microwave assisted synthesis, micro emulsion, reverse micelles, sonochemical synthesis. I use uh, almost all of them in my research lab, and we are going to see some of them during this course, both from a theoretical point of view and then in the lab we are going to use, uh, uh, for example, the soldier approach, uh, the microemulsion approach, and some others. Uh, both uh, approaches, the bottom-up approach and the top-down one, can be carried out in vapor. Uh, liquid, solid, supercritical phase and uh, under, uh, um, under vacuum. Um, since I'm a chemist, and this is a course of advanced inorganic chemistry, we are going to use uh, in the lab uh, the bottom-up approach, so the chemical uh, one, and uh, um, we see in detail uh, different uh, synthetic methodologies. I think that uh, for today, it's, uh, that's all. Thank you very much for your kind attention.